God that's worthy of our trust and our faith. You're a God who is faithful, everlasting. And you are worth worthy of our faith and our trust that we put in you. You're a God who's worthy and able to hold all of us together. To take us, our lives, the very breath you have given us. And make an impact in our world, in our generation. And I thank you for that. That you've called us here, this people, today, this body. To be your servants, to be your children, to be obedient. And to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And today we give you praise and honor. As we come and look into your word today, Father, I pray that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit. You would be our teacher. You would find in us hearts that are humble, that are ready to receive your truth and be shaped by it. That we would be inspired, encouraged, and even empowered to be faithful and obedient to the call that you place on every life in this room. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you see me now? Yes, you can see me now. This day, today, we will start a new uh, series in the book of Luke. We referenced it briefly last week. And uh, I was kind of looking at uh, the history of my preaching here at this church for 12 years. Uh, I've been here as, as a part of this the leadership here in one capacity or another. Actually, it's been a little longer than that. Uh, time flies. In any case, I, I realized in preparation for this week that uh, I've never taken like a book of the Bible and preached exegetically, which is just, that's a big word for taking the Bible and just preaching through it. Um, so you exegete from Scripture. You, so it's this concept of mining from Scripture truth as you just travel through it. And uh, it seems like that over the course of my years here, there's always been a focus that's been different. Uh, Obviously, Pastor Brent was uh, called to be the lead here, and he preached like that in some cases. But so this is a new kind of a new phase for me, a new segment uh, for my ministry to take scripture and just we're just going to try to travel through it. And we're going to try to let it take us where it wants us to go and say to us what it wants us to say. Now, that may sound uh, easy or simple, but I can assure you, <laughs> after the first full week of this journey, uh, it, it's, it's stretching me. It, it's certainly... I've got this new software that's really helped. Um, I had Greek, but I'm telling you, Greek, you know, it killed everybody who ever learned it, this Koine Greek <laughs> stuff. So... <laughs> I'm hoping I can hang in there for a little while at least. So today, uh, we had obviously had the Christmas message two weeks ago. And so that brought us, kind of use that as a you know, kickstart. And that brought us out of the first part of Luke, obviously the birth of Jesus. And so we're going to start today in chapter 3, and we'll travel through it. Uh, next week, I anticipate being in chapter 4. The reason I give you kind of that backdrop information is that I would welcome you guys to, as we, as we go through this, uh, to read, read the Scriptures during the week uh, several times you know, before we get here on a Sunday morning. I believe that your, your, what you hear from the Word uh, will be enriched by reading through it and being familiar with the passage before we get here. And here's something else. If you guys are reading it and you're just like, man, I have this message that I feel like is super important. Uh, you can share that with me at any time, and I would be grateful for that. I would love to hear from you. Uh, I think that stuff is fun and awesome, and uh, I, you know, I'm hoping that somebody along the line will say to me, "Hey, you know, include this 
or at least consider this. Uh, so I would appreciate that. All right. So let's jump right in. Uh, chapter 3 of Luke. And uh, I'll read the first couple of verses and then we'll pause and we'll just start working our way through it. Let's start with verse uh, verse 2, actually. Verse 1. And, and you'll notice as we go through here, before we get in here, you'll notice as we go through here that I'm, I'm going to jump some portions of it simply because Easter's are coming. And do you know what happens at Easter? We got to get there. So we have a, we don't got to get there, but I'd like to get there by Easter. So we're going to have to, there's just so much material that so we're going to try to get there. Anyway, so if, if I jump something, it's not that I'm ignoring Scripture. It's that I have more information than I can possibly um, you know, get out of here. So let's start at verse 2. During the high priesthood of, priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight. And the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So let me just a little backdrop information. And then we're going to move to this fella called John the Baptist. He's kind of the, the central focus of our passage today. As we go through it. So a couple things to note. Uh, Tiberius Caesar was, under, was kind of the emperor of Rome at the time. And so all this fell under the umbrella uh, from Rome. Israel, Jerusalem, that area was all, uh, the whole area of Judea, I guess. Uh, Tiberius Caesar, the emperor of Rome, was known. So, and and I, you run into all these characters when you do these studies. And, and I, by the way, I'm a... I'm a, you know, a nerd or whatever those guys are, so I love this stuff. But he was really known as a really good emperor just from a decision-making process, but with very poor character. I found that very interesting. I mean, we run into these just fascinating. Great emperor, great leader, poor character. I'm not even sure how that works itself out, but I have a notion that I've seen one or two of these fellows running around through my time here. Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. And uh, he was always, in, 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 as we go through history and we look, and not just in this passage, but as we get in further in Luke and, and in the other Gospels, uh, we're going to see that he's always in some kind of conflict with the Jews. We're going to run into him later on as we get through Luke. We're going to run into this guy named Pontius, Pontius Pilate. And uh, if you remember the story of the crucifixion, he is ultimately the one who is there at the very end who kind of puts the seal of approval on the crucifixion uh, of Jesus. And he was, he, he was a, you know, because he hated the Jews, he was constantly killing them. And in fact, <laughs> just, just this is wild stuff. In fact, it was, it was so bad that he ended up losing his position of leadership because he was killing too many of the people he was ruling over. Isn't that crazy? And so he's just such a ruthless guy that hated. And so when you get to, uh, this makes a lot of sense when you get to the end and you say, well, who is this? Who is this pilot guy that Jesus goes and sees at the end? And you start, to, oh, this is the same guy who ended up losing his job because he's killing too many people on the job. And it's just, it's just wild. But anyway, these characters... Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to just briefly touch here, and I've come across it before, but we, we have this feeling, at least maybe the people that I run with, this idea that our world is so much more wicked now than it's ever been in the past. And it's headed down this trajectory of wickedness that, that the gospel is, is dimmed, it's darkened, uh, hope seems to wane. Let me, just, let me just say this. Outside of the American experience over the last 300 years or whatever it's been, that, that's not the case of humanity. Humanity 
has been exceedingly wicked. Remember the flood? So the context of this story is in a time when wickedness, I believe, and the oppression of mankind is much greater in this story, in the setting, the context of this, than we experience today. I believe it is. With that said, I don't, and I don't want to cheat ahead, but however, the application of that for us, what's that mean for us when it, when it comes to living victorious for Jesus? To be right, that we could stand against this kind of a context. I believe in some cases the enemy has lulled us to sleep. He has used our comfort against us. He's allowed us to become, well, encouraged us to become addicted to it. Um, the teachings of Jesus are difficult. And we're going to see that as we travel through here, that the teachings of Jesus, to follow Jesus and to follow the way of the Lord, the way that is narrow and few shall find it, is a consistent assault. It's a consistent assault on who we are, our fleshly desires. It is completely relentless. I feel it. In some ways, I feel like every week I'm saddled with a message that assaults the flesh, assaults the selfish desires of mankind. And I don't know, maybe other preachers feel the same way. That's the feeling I'm like every week. It's the same thing. There's this assault on the flesh, the desires, the selfishness of mankind. And I believe that if we, if we go, as we go through Luke, one of the things we're going to see is that it's going to keep showing up. It is central to the theme of the message of Christ. That His message was so counterintuitive to what the brokenness of humanity is that it's just, it's a constant rub. It's not going to go away. If that bothers you, settle in. Get used to misery because it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. All right, number one. There's this man called John the Baptist. Uh, he called his little play on words there for you guys. He was called, his name was John the Baptist. That's what they called him. And he was also called, called by God. Uh, first, he was called from obscurity. If, you, if we read this, and there's, there's also some, uh, there's some context in Matthew. We're going to stay out of that. Uh, but he's called from a wilderness, and he wore a, a belt made of camel's hair, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Mm, crunchy. That's all I can think of is crunchy. I don't know if he fried them, if he roasted them, but crunchy is all I could think of. Sweet and crunchy. You know, that's not so far off from the sweet and sour chicken that we get from... You know. <laughs> Next time you guys eat it, you're going to think about locusts and wild honey. I know you are. In any case, uh, it says he comes from the wilderness. Uh, in the area of Judea, he comes from the wilderness. In the wilderness, in this, this particular case, just to, where does John come from? Uh, we're, we're going to try to answer that question briefly. So where does John come from? He comes from the wilderness. What's a wilderness? Well, in this particular case, it's an area that's sparsely populated uh, outside of just people traveling through the area on the roads. Or hardy shepherds that would, you know, pasture their sheep in these areas. Very few people lived there. It was very, uh, just really harsh living conditions. Translation, you got to be tough to make it in that kind of environment. John was a guy who came on the scene uh, hardened by the trials of life. Seasoned. A man with character. A man who had some, you know, 30 plus years old, he living in that kind of environment for all those years, prepared him to come to the place. And, and you're going to see, uh, John is, is a guy who's got a little sand in his stomach. He's not afraid of the hard stuff. He's not afraid of the tough stuff. He'll dig right in. I believe the reason John comes prepared is God uses the wilderness to prepare John. Called from this place of obscurity. There's nobody there. Nobody knows. He's, nobody, by the way, in our character development, in our preparation for our ministry, that God calls all of us to a portion, a slice of the kingdom, a slice of Jesus' message. He calls all of us to that. Most of us, almost without exception, He develops our character 
And he develops who we are and how we prepare that ministry for that ministry in relative obscurity, meaning nobody's around when you're practicing good character. Nobody's around when he breaks you, when you're wounded and you seek him and him alone. It requires that God develops men in this kind of way that bypasses leaning on other people, but that we learn to lean on God himself. And I believe the wilderness done that for John. John didn't come to the church, and however you want to translate that. But John didn't come in our setting to the church and go, you know what, I need to get in with these religious leaders and figure out who these guys are, and we'll figure something out, and we'll work together and collaborate. None of that happened. John come in calling for repentance and revival. We're going to get through some of the, some of the stuff that he talked about. He was a prophet, carried a word straight from God. The gospel says he, the word of God came to John. So prophet in those days, there was a couple primary ways that God spoke to people. One was prophets. God would come straight to prophets and he would talk with them either dreams or visions, or they would hear a voice, but he spoke very clearly to prophets, and he chose them prophets, those prophets then to give his word to his people. And the other was angels, uh, dreams, visions, prophets, and then angels was another way. Many times, there's many instances in the Bible where angels would come and uh, speak to people, and we'll see that with the with the Advent of the new covenant, that kind of goes away, and there's a transition as God puts His Spirit in people as prophesied in Isaiah and begins to communicate with them that way. But John's a prophet. He comes. He also baptizes a great number of people. That's how he gets the name John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say how many people he baptized. But Scripture says they came from all over the place, and he was just dunking them at a high rate of speed. I, I would love to see if he had some kind of an assembly line set up. Like, I, you know, we're in, a, we're in this area here where we do manufacturing. Everybody works in the factory or every other body works in the factory. And uh, it's all about streamline. I, I'm just care, I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, did he have a system set up where he had some, you know, pre-dunkers and post-dunkers and then the dunker? And I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm a nerd. What can I say? But I'm curious. But he... he baptized a ton of people. And we'll see later in, the, in chapter 7, there's a ton of people impacted by his ministry as he comes as, his, comes as his guy to make the way level, preparing for Jesus and preparing for the word of Jesus as he's going to bring it. He was brave enough to preach sacrificially. We talked about his character a bit, how, we feel like, how I feel like that was developed in his wilderness, how God developed him. Well, you see that toughness come out. You see that selflessness come out in a way that he comes and preaches the word uh, that, that God had given to him, the word of God that came to him. He comes out and he preaches it fearlessly, sacrificially. I mean, he, he confronts sin. Um, it, in fact, it gets him killed. In the end, when you read the last chapter of John's life, it ultimately gets him killed. It's a big, we're going to stay out of the weeds here. There's too much there to cover, so we're going to have to get there. All right. That's who John is. Called by God, prophet, brave, uh, the God after it. The man was a doer. God said, go prepare the way, and he gets out and starts preaching and baptizing. And he, is, he ain't messing around. He's getting it done. So he's a doer. He's a mover and a shaker. He goes out. He's obedient. And he gets it done. Uh, great model. So... Number two, there's the plain message of John the Baptist. What was causing people to respond to his message in such a way that they would come back and then repent and say, what do I need to do to be saved? And then he would baptize them. So he preached and baptized, preached and baptized. He had to have some people helping him in any case. What's the message that he was preaching that brought people in and they responded to? Well, a few things. Let's, let's read some of it. Uh, let's start verse 7, go to 14. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Let me pause there quickly. In Matthew, that same account has him saying that to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
So there was some, there's some fogginess there. Was it just to them? I'm sure the other people heard it, so it wasn't just singularly there. Number eight, or verse eight, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, does not, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. I'm going to try to just get into that. We're going to talk about you know, what, what did he preach. So number one, he preached condemnation. He, he, dealt, he goes head on to, in my opinion, who he identified as the primary culprits of the problems happening within the church that day, the Israelite nation. He, he goes to the head of the snake and he begins to deal with that. He calls them vipers. Um, they were poisonous and they were poisoning others. This idea that they were misleading and there was deceit in, what, in their message and how they were uh, presenting it and they were keeping others from the kingdom of heaven because of the lies that they would uh, speak and the way they manipulated it. It had turned into a business, for lack of a better word, um, to know God was to have money. Um, to not have money was to be kept from knowing who God, God was. He also preached repent it, repentance. It was basically repent, repent and prove it. Say you're sorry if, you, if you're going to say that, you know, look, I made a mistake, sorry, or I have sinned against God. Let's, let's get rid of the mistake thing. It's bigger than that. It's I have sinned against God. That was the confession Okay, if you're going to say that, prove it to me. Tell me what, tell me what, or here is what you do. And he deals with the tax collectors, the soldiers. He deals with these people in this very practical way. Repent and do something about it. Don't, don't just say you're going to repent and then not do anything. In that, there's two simple facts are stated about forgiveness that I want to quickly point on as we roll through. First of all, forgiveness of sins is conditional. Forgiveness of sins is conditional. It doesn't always feel that way to us. I feel like we sometimes hear things that is, well, God loves you and you're fine just the way you are. God loves you just as you are. But that doesn't mean you can stay there. The fact that He comes and loves us there simply means that there's got to be some movement. Uh, it's conditional. A man must repent to be forgiven. We, we can't come to God with our laundry list of sins and just say, all right, God, I, I want you just to kind of accept me and leave me here in my sin. It doesn't work that way. He says, repent, number one, be baptized. Also, this baptism is a part of the obedience, this immediate baptism. Repent and be baptized. And by the way, baptism is part of this obedience to what God has called us to. It's not just repentance. It's do something about it. Make a public testimony of this. It is part of it. It's a sign. Basically, baptism is a sign that man is repenting and changing his life. It's putting your money where your mouth is in front of more people than just yourself and one other one. Baptism is this public thing that happens. When should baptism happen? Well, in the most sincere state of repentance. I, I think it should happen in, well, when the water's warm. Uh, that's a good time. If you're here and want to be baptized, I would, uh, we would be happy to, to hold you underwater for a while. No. We would be happy to help you with the baptism part of it. Uh, we have a little doohickey right there that uh, we can heat up the water. We'll 
you know, we joke about cooling it down, but it's wintertime. It feels pretty good when it's warm in there. One should baptize it. Baptism happen. It should happen when people are sincere about their repentance and they're ready to walk with God 100%. To give it all to Him. To stick with it. We, again, the kingdom, don't, don't black mark the kingdom. Don't, don't give the kingdom a bad reputation because we've been baptized and then don't walk with God. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. When you get baptized, walk with God. Put your, put your foot in the ground and drive forward. Number three, part of the plain message of Jesus, or of John the Baptist, it's a quite simple one. He preached against pride. In verse 8, he talks about this idea. These people are proud that they're Jews. They're proud that they're called, that they're Abraham's children really is what, the, what he's dealing with. And they're very, very proud of the fact that they're Abraham's children. And they, they kind of operate that way. Well, you know, we're, we're Abraham's children. We don't need to do anything. We're Abraham's children. I mean, we're locked and loaded. You know, I know some people, <laughs> I know some people that sometimes, you know, kind of carry on that way. Uh, that they're kind of grandfathered in. You know, when they change rules in the county, sometimes you don't have to listen to the rules because you get grandfathered in. Well, when it comes to spiritual life, nobody gets grandfathered in. Amen. No one. He preached against this pride of inheriting the gospel or inheriting holiness. There is no such thing as inheriting your parents' faith. The one thing that strikes me as I think about our children, and we have got a, a beautiful group of kids here, but the one thing that strikes me about these children is they have all, they all must come to a place where they work out their own salvation. They must. None of them get in on the backs of their parents. None of them. They must all work out their own salvation. They are all loved by the Father with intense kind of love, right? Do they know that? Do they know that from you? Do they know from you that what it's like to repent and to come before God and ask for forgiveness and accept restoration and to become whole? Set for them a model of what it looks like to receive from the kingdom life. Preaching a coming judgment, number four. John gives this idea, kind of, and I'll, I want to be careful here, but he kind of gives this idea that judgment is imminent, meaning it's about to happen. The axe is at the foot of the tree, he uses this imagery. The axe is at the foot of the tree, and something is about to happen. There is fixing to be judgment. And so, straighten up and fly right. Up this, that's the Johnny version. of uh, Included against this cultural Christianity, uh, inherited Christianity. It's, the judgment is coming against that. Look, nobody is immune to it. We all will be judged on our lives, on our actions. It's, it's one of the things that Jesus came to do was provide judgment. I believe John was bringing that into play. Number five, he preached social justice. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, don't cheat on taxes, don't extort money from people, don't follow greed and learn to be content. It's really a great, wholesome message that John preaches. It's whole, it's complete. He's, he's setting forth a kind of a model that Jesus brings and carries on as he makes the uh, makes the way straight, so to speak, of Jesus. Also, number six, he preached that the Messiah was coming. One whose sandals, he's, he feels like he's not fit to tie. Basically, this idea that there's one coming who's infinitely greater than him, and it's not even close. That Jesus is coming, the Messiah, uh, is coming, and he's much greater than him. He, he comes with a ministry that really is pointing the entire time towards Jesus. It's a great model for our ministry, for all of us personally. It's a great model. Not that our ministry is anything more, ever. I pray that it never is. 
It's never more than simply pointing to Jesus. Because that's all John does. There's one coming. Repent. Be baptized. There's one coming. He's got an axe in his hand. It's at the foot of the tree. He preached, he preached all these things. This is well-rounded message that John brings. It concluded kind of all the, all the woes of society. Number eight, he preached against sin in high places. Uh, I said earlier that it got him killed at the end, and, and he gets killed later on. In the, for today, I want to tell you why he got killed. Herod Antipas. Okay, remember the Herod? That uh, so we're you know Jesus is approximately 30, 33 years old at this point. But remember the Herod that in in the opening story, the Christmas story, he commanded that all the baby boys two years and under in in Judea be killed. Remember this Herod, evil guy, exceedingly evil, wicked, uh, terrible feller. Chad, if I could do the Charles Barkley terrible, I would do it, but I'm not as good at it as you are. He had a couple of boys. One of them was named Herod Antipas. And uh, I think the other one was called Herod Philip. Or maybe it was just Philip anyway. There was two boys. And Herod Antipas was married. He goes to see his brother. His brother was married. And he ended up taking his brother's wife from him. They divorced and he took his brother's wife from him. And John preached against that sin. He preached against that sin. He says, that's not right. And so, you know what Herod does? He's kind of the governor. Herod puts him in jail. And that's the beginning of the end. That's how John's ministry ended. How is it? And I ask this question and I'll just let, let it hang with you. <laughs> let it sit. How is it the guy, that a guy comes and he preaches so magnificently? Just He does a fantastic job. A well-rounded message for a... a, a period of time, we're unsure of how long he preached, but very, very productive ministry. 100% obedient to God and what God's called him to do. At the end, he gets stuck in jail and ultimately gets beheaded. Because, and get this, this is, the story comes full circle. Herod Antipas, which is, would be the granddaughter, it's his brother's daughter, so it's his niece, really, and he's married to her mom. Figure that out. It's the granddaughter of the Herod that initially tried to kill Jesus. It's that granddaughter. Dances before her uncle, who is now her dad. Their dad who had that feller. And he is so impressed. He tells her, you can have whatever you want. Her mom, the guilt got to her to such a degree, her mom says, Ah, oh, ask him for the head of John the Baptist. He hates what we do. He's called sin. The guilt got to her. She asked for the head of John the Baptist and received it. That's how his ministry ended. And you go, wow. See, COVID ain't got nothing on Herod. <laughs> like, that's heavy stuff. When the ruler of the land, you have no power. Bring his head to me. Like, you ain't seen nothing yet. If the gospel has the power to go forward unhindered and be explosive in that environment, think what it can do today when men and women embrace it. But we can't. We're addicted to comfort. We're addicted to comfort. All right, number nine. He preached Jesus the Messiah in three kind of three different ways, and we'll go through those real quickly. Let's pick it up in verse 15. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. So people are starting to stir. I, I had said a couple of weeks ago that the birth of Jesus kind of came as this out of nowhere, out of left field. And I suppose I'm completely wrong on that. Because it feels like maybe, maybe it was out of left field, but there's a 30 year lapse there. So maybe not. I think it's less important than the fact that we get to hear. And there's this sense of building anticipation. There's just something, you know, when you're like, something's about to happen. And I'm not sure what it is. That's kind of the feeling you get here. And maybe because of the preaching of John with 
you know, these hundreds of people, maybe thousands, I don't know how many he baptized, that, that there's this building up that's starting to happen. Who is this Messiah? Where is he? At, at this point, he's largely, you know, he's in, almost in obscurity. Like nobody knows who Jesus is at this point. Uh, he baptized him at the end of his ministry, but like, who is he? Nobody really knows. And so they're like, what, is, it, is John the Messiah? Well, he goes to jail and kind of squashes that. But So in any case, he teaches three kind of three things about the Messiah. Number one, the Messiah's person. He's mightier than I. John preaches that the Messiah is going to be this infinite, this man of God in the flesh kind of deal, much mightier than I, in, in spite of the fact that his message comes and it's powerful and it's great. Also, he preaches the Messiah's baptism. He baptizes Jesus. But on the other note, he says... He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. With the Holy Spirit and with fire. Two quick things, Holy Spirit and fire, because in that it alone is, is probably a couple of messages. The Holy Spirit. How does he baptize with the Holy Spirit? Indwelling Holy Spirit. John is saying this is what Jesus is going to do. He's going to come and he will put into your hearts his Holy Spirit. Why? Why? That you would be empowered to be His children, holy before Him, able to do what's right, able to hear. Remember, we're, we're going to lose some of the prophets. We're going to lose some of the visions. Able to hear. So that's coming. And with fire. What's the fire part? Well, most times in the Bible when we encounter the word fire, we, it is seen under this idea of judgment. What fire would burn up and consume and destroy. So most times when we see this word fire, it's in judgment. This particular case, we're dealing with something a little bit different. This one, we're talking a little bit more about cleansing. This the fire has a way of kind of letting all the dross pull away from you as a people. That, that the person would stand and be purified and cleansed by fire. Maybe by difficulty. Maybe by suffering, maybe by struggle, but that a person would be cleansed by fire. That's what Jesus was going to do. Two primary things. He's going to fill people with the Holy Spirit, and he would cleanse them with fire. So great. So that's what John is preaching. This is this is who's coming, John's saying. And then also the Messiah's judgment. Uh, he's got this winnowing fork in his hand, this idea of, you know, threshing. He's you know, taking the wheat and the chaff and separating them. And eternal fire is the destiny for the judgment of those who've not lived for God. So it's quite, quite clear. All right, number three, the lesson of John the Baptist. He was continuously pointing to Jesus. We saw that earlier. Uh, kind of sent as this way maker for Jesus to decide, making the, the hills you know, straight, cutting them off, filling in the valleys, that it's a level path, that Jesus is coming and he has gotten ready with his message. There's also this kind of challenge that John says. And I, I think for us, this challenge. Have, have in our lives, have there been times and are there now of time of complete confession? Where we come to God and we take this message that John preaches and we say, he says, repent and be baptized. Have we confessed and repented the sin? In our lives. Repentance is this idea that, obviously, that we do something about it. Prove it. Have our lives kind of been this way maker? See, I think John the Baptist provides this kind of glimpse of some of the way that we're called as believers. You know, we, we take the word of God with us wherever we go. But if we haven't loved people well, if, if, we have been, if we have harmed our testimony by our actions and our words before we have gotten there, then what testimony do we have left? What work can Jesus do when we have made a mess of it before He got there? What I mean by that is if we have, if we have acted unbecoming of believers, if we have lived lives far from God, and then we say to people, you should meet this Jesus. And they're looking at us going, Jesus hasn't helped you do squat. You've blocked him out. 
have we been waymakers in the way that we have lived for God? That when we introduce Jesus to the people that know us, they say, ah, that's what it is. Or when we speak of Jesus, they go, man, he hadn't done much for you. <laughs> That'd be a hard word. Have we been waymakers for Jesus? And that we allow him through our actions and words, to, to get into people's lives. Every, every area of our life, from work, from play, hobbies, we, we, we tell people about Jesus long before we say it. We tell them long before we say it. What do we tell them? To me, to me that's one of the primary kind of challenges that John gives us. His life was all about making a way for Jesus. And I'm, I'm looking at us and saying, have, have we done that with the way that we live our lives? Actions almost always speak louder than words. With the least of these, when we encounter the most broken people in our world, do they know that Jesus loves fiercely? Have we been generous in when they've been poor? Have we been chain breakers when they've been held captive? By addictions of every kind. Have we been chain breakers? Have we showed compassion and given them a cloak and a tunic when they've Smelled bad or had bad hygiene. That sounds, that sounds harsh, but you know what? We are finicky people. We're turned off by the smallest little things. Like almost we're above that. I think God would look at our mess and go, no, you're not above that, clearly. Look at the stink you're raising. The same way that God called John from this place that's completely unexpected. Completely unexpected. This place of wilderness, of barrenness, of brokenness. It mirrors my story. It mirrors my life. I too was called from a place of complete brokenness, from a wilderness. Most of you have. You're called from a place of brokenness to significance. From a place of brokenness to wholeness. To a pl from, from this position in our lives where we're broken and condemned. Addressed and saved by a Savior who comes to us and says, Go. I'm calling you to go and make a way for my message. And you're going to do it with your life. You're going to do it with sacrifice. You're going to do it with love. And you're going to do it with service. But Go calling you. A place from brokenness and obscurity. He calls all of us to it. We talked about ministry positions this morning. Most of the people in those positions are not comfortable. Praise the Lord. I don't like tension in my life, just in other people's lives. It's a great thing. Amen. But it's beautiful. It's beautiful. He calls all of us from obscurity to something that our lives would count for something, that we're way makers for the risen Lord, all of us. Stand with me, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. That brings to us uh, a challenge to repent, a challenge to be real, to not allow our brokenness to keep us from ministry, but to entrust our lives into your hand. And I pray that if, if there's anyone here or in the, in the world of Facebook that, that doesn't know that they have been called. 
I pray that by the power of your spirit today that you would press on their hearts this truth universally. That we are your children. And you call us to be your children in word, in deed, in holiness of heart. You call us to be your children. And I thank you for that. But if there are those who don't know that truth, I pray that by the power of your spirit you would press that up on them, that they would come to a place of obedience, embracing this call you've placed on their lives to draw near to you, to obey you, to walk with you, to become waymakers in our generation, in our time, to prepare a way for your word as our lives speak wordlessly to our generation. Empower us, enable us to be obedient, your children, holy before you. We cast ourselves on your care. We rely on the power of your spirit to set us apart, to enable us, empower us, to be holy and to be ministers of your word. I pray that as we go from here today, that your peace would guard our hearts, that we would know your word in our hearts this week, that it would dwell richly in us. Give us your strength and your wisdom. And we will give you praise for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all real good. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. God bless.